Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bible study. I will pray and we'll get started. Father, we do thank you and we praise you always for the opportunity that we have to gather together to study your word, to learn and grow in you. And I thank you that because more than two or three are gathered here with us, Father, without a doubt you are in our midst and we know you're present with us by way of your spirit, your precious Holy Spirit, whom you've given to us to be our lead and guide, our help, our counsel, our advocates, the Holy Spirit, as always, do what you do. Think through my mind, speak through my lips, the illumination of the revelation of God. May it go forth to meet the needs of the people, spirit, soul, and body. And I know that you'll see to it that the word goes forth with clarity, unhindered and unchecked by any unseen or opposing forces, because those forces have been neutralized, rendered ineffective as a result of the finished work of Christ at Calvary. And it's in that finished work that we do rest, for we have entered into your rest, Father, and there we remain, and where we remain is everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. Experiencing your shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, walking in the fullness of your blessing, and flourishing in every aspect of our lives as our souls flourish. So we thank you for the access to your peace that we have by faith. And that same peace will let reign in our hearts because you left it with us. And it's your peace that surpasses all understanding, guarding our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we don't have to be anxious or worry about anything, but in prayer and supplication, make our requests and petitions made known to you. We thank you that we can cast every care on you because you care so much for us. And we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that everything we need will be added to us. You are Jehovah Shalom, our peace. And you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. And you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. You sent your word and healed us. He took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And by his stripes, we were healed. So it's done and settled according to your word. We are a healed people. We are not a sick people. We're not a distraught people. We're not searching high and low for our healing, but we are the healed, defending our position in you, Father, against our defeated foe, the adversary. And so I thank you, anyone experiencing any kind of pain, both present and with us, watching online, any heaviness, that it must depart now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so, Father, I thank you this day that the hearts are ready, the ground is prepared, the soil is rich for the seed, incorruptible of your word to be sown into their hearts and produce in their lives. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And make your way to Mark 1. Mark chapter 1 and verse 21. We're continuing on with the believer's power. Normally when I teach this message, it's entitled the believer's authority or the authority of the believer. <laughs> but... um. I want to focus on more than authority. I want to focus on the full scope of the power of God that both he possesses and that which he has made available to us, his people, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Matthew, uh, Mark 1, we, we left off with Matthew 7. That's where we finished last week, Matthew 7. But Mark 1 is where we want to begin verse 21 once again talking about the believer's power the believer's power verse 21 then they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and what did he do he taught he entered the Sabbath or the synagogue on the Sabbath and taught and they were astonished at his teaching they were astonished. Why were they astonished? Well, first off, what did it mean that they were astonished? They marveled and they were in awe. They, they, didn't, they didn't understand where this teaching was coming from because they knew that this was not one who had formal rabbinical training. So where is he getting this revelation from? They were astonished at his teaching. And then look at what it says next. This is very telling. It says, for he taught them as one having what? Authority. He taught them as one having authority. This is exousia. Notice what it says next. And not as the scribes. So what does that tell us about the scribes? They didn't teach with authority. The scribe, what is a scribe? You all know what a scribe is. 
And the definition for scribe today is pretty much the definition for scribe back then. Scribes could, would also be known as, as lawyers, clerks, or secretaries. That was the scribe. So what this tells me is that all the scribes ever did was just read the law. They read something that was written. Did they believe it? We don't know. How real was it to them? We don't know. They're reading what they've been raised to read. They're reading what they've been taught to read. They're also reading traditions passed down. But this Jesus shows up and he teaches like he knows what he's talking about. He's teaching with an authority they're not accustomed to. So they're astonished. They're used to a recital. But here's someone teaching illumination like they've never seen or heard before. So he taught them as one having authority or power. Once again, the Greek word here is exousia, which is specifically authority. Verse 23. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. The synagogue, like the church, was, was the people and where the people met. So this is a demon-possessed man. This, this, would, this would be tantamount to, on one of our Sundays, a, a demon-possessed person being in the service and disrupting the service. Matter of fact, I think that happened a couple weeks ago. It, 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 it said during y'all's worship, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out saying, what? Let us alone. There's something else that we can pay attention to here. It's like, the, it's like this unclean spirit. First off, notice a man, singular, with an unclean spirit, singular, and he cried out, let us, plural, alone. Who's the us? The numerous unclean spirits on the inside of this man. Because this man would not have said, let us alone. He, the man who was who was possessed by a demon, the man, as a matter of fact, most likely on the inside of his self, wanting freedom and deliverance, he would have fully embraced and welcomed Jesus coming to free him from demonic possession and torment. The demon said, let us alone. Sounds to me like unclean spirits in the synagogue may have been an occasional thing. And unclean spirits in the synagogue didn't have to be worried about being tormented because no one was reading a word with authority. But now they see Jesus. And now we have a problem. Let us alone. What have we to do with you? You're messing up our flow. Jesus of Nazareth, did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. We know who you are. Oh, holy one of God. And you might think to yourself, well, of course they know who he is. But there's a reason that they're saying this. As a matter of fact, the study that I've done over the past year has shown me why demons ask the questions they ask when they encounter Jesus. Like when they said, have you come to torment us before the time? Is it, it's, it's not the time yet. Have you come to torment us before the time? Because we actually know our time. We actually know that we have an end. They probably have a side hope that their king, the devil, will work something out so that their time doesn't come, but they know about their time. Why do they ask questions like, like or make, make, make a, 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 a request? Why do they beg Jesus, don't command us to go to the bottomless pit? Don't do that. Why are you tormenting me? Why are you here? We know who you are. See, remember who demons are. Remember what demons are. Remember when demons showed up. Demons aren't as old as angels. Demons aren't as old as humans. They showed up after, they showed up after the days of the flood. These are creatures that were, or bodiless spirits, bodiless spiritual creatures that were, were stuck on the earth with no bodies. That's why they what? Possess. Demons don't have their own bodies like angels do. Angels have their own bodies. That's why Hebrews 13.2 says, Some have unwittingly entertained angels. How have some unwittingly entertained angels? How have some of us engaged those 
whom we thought were humans or mere mortals like ourselves, but in actuality, they were angels. But we didn't know because they didn't look like an angel. They look like, they look like us. They look like you and I. And we see angels assuming the form of humans in other places in Scripture, like, like the, the angels in the city of Sodom. In which, in which Lot asked them, do you want to rest? Do you want to eat? Spirits don't need to rest or eat. What did Lot see? Lot, see? Lot saw creatures that looked like him. Because angels can transform into humans. They have their own bodies. They have the power to do that. Demons don't have bodies. They're bodiless spirits. They became bodiless when the flood hit and drowned the giants. So now what have they been doing? They've been searching the earth looking for a host. Looking for whoever would welcome them in. And when they find a home, they don't want to let it go. What does the scripture say? When an unclean spirit is cast out, he goes through dry places. He comes back and he finds his house swept in order. And then he goes and gets seven more spirits more wicked than himself. And the eight of them, what? Take up residence once again in that body, in that house. So, so demons have not seen what angels have seen. But demons have been made aware of things that angels are aware of. And so... This is why they're crying out, let us alone. It's not time yet, is it? Did you come to destroy us? Is it time for us to be? No, it's not time for us to be destroyed. Why are you here, O Holy One of God? We know who you are. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out. Then they were all amazed. So that they question among themselves, saying what? What is this? What new doctrine is this? Why do they think this is new doctrine? Demons weren't new to them. Neither were exorcists new to them. We know exorcists were not new to them. Because in the book of Acts, is it chapter 19? Where the scripture says, Jewish itinerant exorcists. So Jewish exorcists were not uncommon. Itinerant meaning traveling. Traveling Jewish exorcists. The Jews had, had uh, 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 rituals and, and, and expulsion rites. Uh, uh, practices by which to remove a demon from, from someone's body. Or, or remove a demon from a person. And those rituals were just as long as the rituals of the heathens. But here comes Jesus simply saying, get out. So they asked the question, what new doctrine is this? Because we've never seen anything like this. Exorcism doesn't work like this. It's not as expeditious as this. What is happening here? What is this? What new doctrine is this? And then here's that A word again. For with what authority What's the Greek word here? Once again, exousia. For with power and authority, he commands even the. Whenever you see even the, remember the seven, he came back and said, Lord, even the demons. Like that's the highest place of power one can, can attain, one can arrive at. What did they say? They said, they said, for with authority, he commands even, which means he commands a whole lot of other stuff, but he commands even the demons, the unclean spirits. And, and what do they do? They obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. What we're teaching on Sunday is the Lord's report, as well as this message. You, you're going to notice a lot of scriptures are going to be crossing over you'll see that in the in the weeks to come look now at, at Luke 4 31 this is the this is the same account but this is this is Luke's recording of this account and I, I just want to point out point out something here that Luke highlights majority of it is the same but it's always good to get 
the full scope of the gospel. So Luke 4, 31, which reads, Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. See, remember what Mark said. It said immediately on the Sabbath, singular, he entered the synagogue and he what? And he taught. But what is Luke telling us? It wasn't just this one Sabbath in which he would do this. Luke says what? He went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. We, we could even add this as he was accustomed to doing, as, as he did often, as he had done before. Doing what? Teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching. For his word was with authority. This is why they're astonished. They're not used to that. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Another reason that they could be speaking in the plural is that they know that when their time comes or when they see the one who can bring about their end, they know it's the end for all of them. So think about how the spirit realm work, works it, or, or how, how communication and information travels in the spirit realm. Right? The demons have a network. Satan has a network. Remember, Satan's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at the same time. So he's ha he has to have a masterful network in operation at all times. He, he's not omniscient. He doesn't have all information at once. But he has agents everywhere. Passing information from one demon to one angel to another demon to an angel to a minion to a cohort. Along with unregenerate humans and those who have committed themselves to him. So he's got a massive network. So information can travel fast in the spirit realm. Much faster in the spirit realm than it can in the natural realm, All right? So he's not omnipresent, but he knows a lot that's happening on the earth. Uh, or he's not everywhere, that is. He's not, not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. And of course, he doesn't have all power. He's powerful, but he doesn't have all power. So one demon could easily be representing the cry or concern of all demons. Let us alone. Because if it's the end of me, if you're the one here, if you've come to destroy me, you've come to destroy us. So let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You notice that. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Just like we read in Mark. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him. Notice Mark said convulsed. And he did not hurt him. And they were all amazed. And they spoke among themselves saying, what a word this is for with authority and power. And that's what I wanted you to notice. Notice that in Mark, it simply reads for with authority, he commands authority, meaning what in the Greek exousia. But what does Luke record? For with authority and power. Well, wait a minute. Authority is power. So what's the and power about? That's dunamis. Dynamis, dunamis. You can, you can say the word either way, but, but, but that's ability. So we can read it this way here in, in, in Luke. Verse 36 again, then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves saying, what a word this is for with authority and ability, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. For with power and power, not just power, but and power. For with power and power, for with authority and ability, for with exousia and dunamis, he what? Commands the unclean spirits and they come out and the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Where'd he get the authority from? From the Father. Where'd he get the ability from? The Holy Spirit. Remember, after John baptized him, fully immersed him in water, who came down like a dove and descended upon him? The Holy Spirit. Notice, you don't see Jesus doing any 
great works, signs, or wonders until after when? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Not until the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is it that, is it that God is limited in his ability? No, God's orderly. And if Jesus is the model we are to model after, if he's the example to follow, then Jesus has to live a particular way in which we can replicate. Right, so we're not God, so we can't just conjure up anything at will. We don't have ability until the Holy Spirit comes upon us. So Jesus, who dumbed himself down by coming to earth, by, by, by putting an earth suit on and, and, and exiting the womb of a woman just like all of us. See, that's something we can relate to. We can't relate to sitting on top of heaven. But we can relate to being born of a woman. So the example that Jesus set is the example that a, a human redeemed of God should operate in. And part of that is being filled with the Holy Spirit, knowing that signs, wonders, and demonstrations of power will not occur, not in our lives, until after the Holy Spirit comes upon us and fills us. Jesus shows us this. So it's, it's as Luke recorded, for with authority and ability, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Let's keep going. Look at Matthew 10, 1. Now, everyone's astonished, based on Mark 1, based on Luke 4, everyone's astonished. They're in awe of his demonstration of both authority and ability. Now, one might say, well, it's who he is. We wouldn't expect anything less. Jesus says, well, it's not all just for me. I'm in the mood to share today. So, what do we see in Matthew 10? He doesn't hoard it all for himself, does he? Even though he has it all. Matter of fact, he has all power, shares his power, and still has all power. See, it's not like other superheroes who, if they give some of their power away, it makes them weaker. Because they don't have all their power because they've, they've released some. That's not the case with Jesus. He has all power, gives us power, and still has all power. Matthew 10, 1. And when he had called his, who? His 12 disciples. When he called his 12 disciples, he gave them something. What did he give them? Power? Over unclean spirits to do what? They, the 12 could cast out demons. And to what? Heal all kinds of sickness and, and all kinds of disease. What's the difference between sickness and disease? Seems like there's a difference here. Well, they're the same and they're different. In other words, they're the same and they're unique. Because sickness means disease in the Greek and disease means sickness in the Greek. However, for sickness, a sickness could be a malady and an infirmity as well. Even in, a, in figurative terms, it could be a moral issue. Disease, on the other hand, means what? Disease can mean debility it can also mean infirmity, bodily weakness. And here's a word that it means that sickness doesn't mean softness. In other words, that which weakens. Soften likened to weaken. So we gave him power over demons, sicknesses, and diseases. He gave them power. What's the Greek word here? Exousia. He gave them what? Gave them authority. Jesus gave the 12 authority. They have it now. So, so when a man, and look at what it says again. He gave them power to do what? He gave them power to cast demons out. 
That means if they take the power Jesus gave them, they could what? Cast a demon out. And yet, a father brings his child to Jesus because he said, I took them to your disciples, but they couldn't cast them out. They couldn't. If you tell me I can't do something, you're telling me I don't have the ability to do it. That I'm not able to do it. But that wasn't true. From the father's perspective, it was. I brought them to your disciples. I mean, they have a bit of a reputation too. But they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. That's how the father saw it. Why? Because the son is still sick and demon possessed. Jesus says, bring him to me. Rebukes the demon. The son is well within the hour. And then the disciples pull Jesus to the side privately. And they ask a stupid question. Why couldn't we do it? What do you mean, why couldn't you do it? Wrong question. Why didn't you do it? Because Jesus clearly, see, that's Matthew 17. We're looking at Matthew 10 here. Seven chapters earlier, they had received the authority to cast out demons. It wasn't a case of them not being able to cast out that father's child's demon. They didn't do it. And Jesus says why they didn't do it. He said, because of your unbelief. You didn't believe. You had power to cast out a demon, but you didn't believe. And so that's why you were unsuccessful. Here it is right here. He gave them power over. He gave them authority over. Look at Luke 9.1. In Luke, we see something we don't see anywhere else in the gospel. And I believe there's a reason why Luke records it this way. Got to remember, Luke didn't walk with the fellas. Luke didn't walk with them. Luke received his account from a credible source. So what's Luke doing? Luke is recording everything that has already taken place. That's why you have his genealogy written. There's, there's two reasons why Luke's genealogy is written the way Luke's genealogy is written. You all remember Matthew 1, it opens up. Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham. And then it gives G Jesus genealogy from Abraham all the way to his birth. Starts with Abraham. Why does it start with Abraham? Weren't there men born? But Abraham had a father. Weren't there generations before Abraham? Why does Matthew begin with Abraham? Matthew's audience is a Jewish audience. Matthew's writing to the Hebrew audience. They know who the patriarch is. Begins with who was given the promise. That's Abraham. What's Luke doing? Luke's just recording everything. Luke's just giving you... So his genealogy doesn't start from... The beginning, it starts from the end and works itself back to the beginning, even going past Abraham all the way to who? All the way to Adam. So Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, begins with the patriarch who received the promise, and then we have 42 generations up until Jesus. Luke works backwards. Luke works backwards from Jesus all the way to the beginning, 62 generations, to Adam. Why? Because what's Luke doing? Luke, Luke, Luke is coming up after events have already uh, occurred and he's simply recording everything that has happened. Also, Luke's audience is Greek. It's not Jewish. And the way Greeks wrote their genealogies were in reverse. They started with the young and they worked their way back to the oldest of the patriarchs. So Luke's primary Greek audience understands why Luke is writing this genealogy in the way he's writing his genealogy. And I believe that is a contributing factor to why Luke records this in Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Look at what it says. It says, then he called his, who? Twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority. Wait a minute. Power and authority? Well, if authority means authority, then shall I assume that power means dunamis? Which in the Greek it does. This reads here. Now, now Mark or Matthew don't record this. 
Luke does. Luke, Luke says he called his 12 disciples and he gave them ability and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. I believe this is written this way for one reason or multiple reasons. First reason, remember Luke is recording events that have already occurred. So Luke is, Luke is, is, Luke's recording the finished work. So by, think about it, by the time Luke records his gospel or his gospel account, the disciples have already gone out with both authority and ability. The Holy Spirit's already come. Remember, the disciples don't get ability until they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus in John 14 shares this promise with them. He says, I will pray to the Father to send you a, he says, another helper, another one. And he words it this way. He says, another helper, the spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive. Why? Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But then John records it this way. Jesus saying, but you know him. Watch this. For he is now present with you and future will be in you. So, because the Holy Spirit was on Jesus and filled Jesus and they were with Jesus, they were with the Holy Spirit. They were with him, but he was yet to be in them. And the reason why he was yet to be in them, because the same John in John chapter 7 records what? The Holy Spirit had not yet been given because the Son of Man had yet to be glorified. So that's why Jesus had the full scope of the Holy Spirit's ministry. Jesus also qualified to receive the Holy Spirit. Because what qualifies you to receive the Holy Spirit? Having a righteous nature. You, 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 if you have a sinful nature, you can't receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus told him that. The spirit of truth whom the world can't receive. They can't receive him. That's how you know he wasn't talking about salvation. He had to be talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. He had to be. Because if he was talking about the Holy Spirit's part in salvation, that would mean the world couldn't get saved. So you know he wasn't talking about salvation. He had to be talking about another spiritual transaction that occurred after salvation. The world can be saved. Only the church can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's why he says the spirit of truth. He's telling I'm talking about you being filled with the Holy Spirit. The spirit of truth whom the world can't receive. Why? It neither sees him, neither does it know him. But you know him because you've been walking with me. And he's on me and in me. So you know him. He's been with you and he will be in you. So Luke, looking from that lens, says that he gave them what? He gave them ability and authority. He gave them ability and authority because by the time I record this, they'll have the ability. But also, number two, they were with he who had the ability. Okay. But look at what it says here. Verse one, he called his 12 together and gave them power and power. Power and power. Ability and authority, dynamis and exousia. You guys still with me? You all, all right. Look at Luke 10. Luke 10, verse 17. One of my favorite passages. The 70. You know, the 70 got what the 12 got. Luke 10, 17. How do we know the 70 got what the 12 got? Because all you got to do is read the beginning of the 10th chapter of Luke. And you'll see that he tells them the same thing he told the 12. You had 12 and then he had 70 and in the upper room you had 120. You know those 120 got what the 70 got. Matter of fact, some of the 120 were the 12 and the 70. Because 12 and 70 are only going to give you 82. If we got 120, we got another 38. But the 70 got what the 12 got. Same exousia, same authority. And he tells them the same thing. So, in Luke 10 verses 1 through 12, 
it records that he gives them the, the authority. Same authority he gave the 12. Then he gives a woe to particular cities in verses 13 through 16. By the time he's done with that, we get to Luke 10, 17, and the 70 have returned. The moment he gave the 70 authority to do what? To cast out demons and to heal all types and manner of sickness and disease. They went out and they started doing it. Now they're returning with joy. Look at verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord. Even. Just like, just like when they heard Jesus teach and then saw him cast out a demon. They said, what kind of authority is this where even the demons respond to him? And now the 70 come back with the power and authority or the authority that he gave them saying, Lord, we did what you said with what you gave us. We went out. And, and we started laying hands on the sick and they got healed. And we spoke to diseases and they departed. And there were blind people, but when they encountered us, they weren't blind anymore. And there were deaf people, and when they encountered us, they weren't deaf anymore, Lord, even the demons. And notice once again, this is what it means to to share a little piece of your power with your, with your people, your subjects, your church, and your sheep, and still have all of it. Folks serving Satan, they wouldn't be able to say this. What the seven are about to say. So to emphasize what they said, let's start off with what they didn't say. Notice the seven don't say, Lord, even the demons are subject to you which they are. That's been proven in previous scriptures that the demons are subject to Jesus. But that's not what the 70 came back and said. They didn't say, Lord, even the demons are subject to you. They said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. In your name. Demons aren't subject to Fred in Fred's name. But demons are subject to Fred in the name of Jesus. Oh, you guys don't realize who you are. Anyone ever heard of Michael the Archangel? Y'all know he a bad somebody, right? I need you to know how bad Michael is. Nobody wants it with Michael. Gabriel doesn't want it with Michael. And there's no contention between them. It's just, you know, the big brother you don't want to mess with. Because Michael is military. Michael's for combat. Now, all angels can fight, but Michael has been specifically created to guard and to protect and to fight. He is the only angel in the Bible called an archangel. Now, do I believe Gabriel is an archangel? I do. Does the Bible say it? No. But we know he has a lot of authority. Because he said, I'm Gabriel, when he presented himself to, to Joseph and Mary. He said, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Lord. Sound like a lot of authority to me. So it's, it's been assumed along with some others that Gabriel is an archangel. Because arc means chief. You're a chief angel. But for whatever reason, this is what I love about God. It causes people like me to have to go dig elsewhere. But he only highlights Michael as an archangel. And there's a scripture in Jude 9 that talks about an event that, once again, the Bible doesn't talk about. Because Satan... And Michael are having a fight, an argument, a spat about the body of Moses. They, they contended with each other over the body of Moses. Me, meaning that the devil was coming at Michael saying, where's he at? Where was he buried? Where's his body? And Michael, I believe, didn't know because God didn't tell him. Why did the devil go to Michael? Because Michael oversees Israel. Daniel, in the 12th chapter, was told, Michael, your prince, 
meaning the prince of Israel. Michael is the chief prince over the nation of Israel. Michael guards and protects Israel. Michael also know, knows where all the bodies are buried. Because he's also known as Israel's grave digger. So the devil comes to Michael saying, you got to know where the body of Moses is. And Michael actually doesn't know. Why? Because Deuteronomy 34 says, God himself buried Moses. You got to be a, a, some kind of somebody to get God to bury you. I think we all wish God would bury us. God didn't have people bury Moses. God buried him. That means Michael didn't know where he was buried. But guess what Michael said to the devil? He didn't go back and forth with him. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Michael didn't say, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. He said, the Lord rebuke you. But that's not how you and I talk. We don't say the Lord rebuke you. We rebuke you in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus. That's the authority we have. That's why the 70 said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now, notice that they return with joy. I want to, for a moment, I want to skip verse 18 and 19. Look at verse 20. Why do you think Jesus says, nevertheless, do not rejoice? Look at what he says. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the, subject, that the spirits are subject to you. He says, rather rejoice because what? Your names are written in heaven. So watch this. In verse 17, they come back with joy because the demons are subject to them in the name of Jesus. And when you get down to verse 20, Jesus says, don't rejoice for that reason. Rather rejoice for this reason. Meaning what? The 70 have joy about what they've just seen. They're impressed with what they've seen done in the name of Jesus. So there's a, there's a, there's a twofold. I'm going to give you the secondary first, and then I'm going to give you the primary. Jesus is saying two things here in verse 18. Let's deal with the second thing that he's saying or that's being implied. The, we know that he wants them humbled and to rejoice for the right thing. Verse 20 proves that, does it not? Don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are in heaven. You can rejoice when a person's free from demonic possession, but don't just rejoice because you're wielding the power of God that allows you to rebuke demons. So they are impressed with what they've seen. If you look at the beginning of verse 18, it doesn't make sense to respond to somebody like this. If, if I'm coming to you and I'm saying, brother so-and-so, even the demons are subject to me in the name of Jesus. It doesn't seem like you would immediately respond with, I saw. But why does Jesus respond to them? Or what's a part of the reason that Jesus responds to them in this way? Because they're coming about talking about what they've seen. And they're rejoicing about what they've seen. So Jesus says, let me humble you really quickly. Because I need you to focus on souls in heaven. I need you to focus. That's where your joy really needs to be. So since you're impressed with what you've seen, let me tell you what I've seen. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Did you see that? You didn't, did you? Because you weren't there. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's the second thing he's saying. But let me tell you what the first thing that he's actually, that he's really implying here, that he's really saying to them. He's, he's doing two things at once. He's simultaneously teaching them humility and, and what to rightfully rejoice at but then he's also letting them know, I'm proud of what you've been doing in my name. Because the Greek, when you break the Greek down in this passage, it literally speaks to something that just occurred. So I'm going to add some words here. I'm not adding to the scripture. I'm adding some words to bring more clarity to the scripture. 
I'm going to add these words. I know you have because. And it will read like this. Verse 17, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I know they are because I've noticed Satan's been falling like lightning. The, the Greek language actually reveals that Jesus was saying that, that in the present time and moment, the powers of Satan were being pulled down like lightning. Why? Because the 70 were going out, casting out demons, healing the sick, opening blind eyes, opening deaf ears. So when you and I go forth in that same power, we are affecting the kingdom of darkness. And pulling his power down and his strongholds are being removed like lightning falling from heaven. Then he says in verse 19, Behold, I give you the what? Authority. I believe the traditional reads power. I like how the traditional reads because we, we come to the conclusion after reading verse 19 that we've been given power over the power. Behold, I give you the power or authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power or ability of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus is telling us what's needed to overcome the ability of the adversary. Ability alone will not overcome the ability of the adversary. See, if, if we come at the devil with our ability and our own power, we're losing. We're losing every time. It, it's no contest. But if he comes at us and we respond with the authority of Jesus, the authority we have in Jesus trumps the ability of the adversary and the kingdom of darkness. The devil actually has on his own, he has more power than you have on your own. But with Jesus in heaven back in your play and your every move, his power pales in comparison to what we're working with and what we have access to. Now, remember, because you and I are on this side of the cross, we know what we're working with in its fullness. We have both the authority of Jesus and the ability of the Holy Spirit. Because when Jesus said in Acts 1-8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that was dynamis. That was ability. So, so watch this. You have the authority of Jesus. He gave, listen, he gave the 12 authority and he gave the 70 authority. Would it be safe to assume that he gave the church authority? Absolutely. Absolutely. When he told, when he told, when he told Peter, I give you the keys. And he wasn't just telling Peter. Neither was he telling Peter, Peter, I'm giving you the keys. No, he was talking to his disciples. And any who would follow him, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Keys means authority. So I give you kingdom authority. If you believe in Jesus, you have kingdom authority. It doesn't matter if you're the 12 or the 70. If you believe in Jesus, you have kingdom authority. Therefore, you have the authority or exousia of Jesus. When you get filled with the Spirit, you get the dunamis of the Holy Spirit. So you got ecstasy and dunamis. You're literally willed. What are we doing with this authority and this ability? What? He said, behold, I give you the power to trample on the power. I give you the power to walk on the power. I give you the power to step on the power. I give you the power to stomp on the power. Of the adversary. Serpents and, and scorpions. Scorpions are, are actually serpents as well. Because the serpent, we, we don't, when we hear the word serpent, you know, we, we, we think snake. This is the only thing we think of. But in, in our everyday language, when do we use the word serpent? Where do we even see it? Do you go to the zoo and go to the area where the serpents are? No. See, the word serpent became specifically affiliated or associated with the snake only. 
But remember, this is a book of antiquity. And the word serpent didn't just mean snake. A serpent was anything that crept, hissed, or stung. If it hissed, it's a serpent. If it crawled, if it was creepy, serpent. If it stung, serpent. But here, he's, he's, he's making sure that, that the 70 understood everything's covered here. I give you the authority, the exousia, to trample on. That means they're under your feet. Serpents and scorpions and over all the ability of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Then he says, but nevertheless, don't rejoice in this. See what he's saying? He said, don't rejoice in, in, in what you have the power to do to the enemy. Thank God for that. But that's not what we're rejoicing in. He says, rather, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. There's nothing greater than that to rejoice over or rejoice about. But of course, we also, what? We're going to rejoice when people are set free from the power of the enemy. But we're not just rejoicing because we got this power. We can just wield this power. We can do damage to the kingdom of darkness. That's the wrong posture. Okay. Look at, look at Luke 8.46. Now this is very telling. We're going to go back to back two chapters. This is the account of the woman with the issue of blood. I talked about this Sunday. We read it from Matthew's perspective. But both Mark and Luke are the only two that record th- these specific words. As a matter of fact, Mark records it f- as a narrator. But Luke records Jesus actually saying it. And look at what he says in verse 46. But Jesus said, why, why, why does this verse begin with, but Jesus said? Well, remember, he asked a question, who touched me? And the disciples respond to that with, well, really, Jesus? You see all these people, and you're asking who touched you. The multitudes are literally pressing against you. Have you all seen on TV when the paparazzi... And, and, and the news and the cameras, as well as the fans, are trying to come into contact with a celebrity as they're making their way from their car to the hotel door. I mean, you've seen it before. And you can YouTube. The one, the one who had it the worst was Michael Jackson. If you ever saw the droves of people, that's how it was for Jesus, if not worse. The 12 disciples had to function as 12 security guards to get him through crowds. So everybody's pressing against him. So when he asked the question, who touched me? The disciples are saying, look around. But then in verse 46, Jesus said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not just talking about these crowds. He said, somebody touched me for I perceive power leaving me. Now, if that power went out of him, then that's the power that healed the woman of her issue of blood, right? Well, this power is dunamis. So it appears that dunamis, oh, watch this. Dunamis is the power that's breaking the sicknesses and the diseases. Exousia is the right to do it. It's both the right to do it and to receive it. Let's keep going. Look at Matthew 28. 18, this is Matthew recording his recording of the commission, the great commission. All, all, all of the uh, gospel writers have a piece of the great commission. They all have a piece. So in Matthew's account, this is what we read. We're going to read verse 18 and just the first word of verse 19. Verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying what? All, all what? Yep, depending on your translation, all power, all authority. Greek word exousia, so this is talking about authority. Jesus said what? He said, all authority has been given to me, where? Okay, If if all authority has been given to Jesus in heaven and on earth, Here's my next question. What is he doing with authority on earth 
if he's in heaven? Because we're on earth. Okay. So let's work with that for a second. Because we're on earth. So Jesus says, I, I won't be with you, talking to his disciples. I won't be with you long. But here's what I'll do. I'll do you solid. I pray to the Father to send you another helper so that when I go, he'll come. Now, it's interesting that when Jesus said this, the Holy Spirit was on him. The Holy Spirit was already in the earth on him and in him only. So when Jesus ascended, that means the Holy Spirit's work with Jesus was finished, which means the Holy Spirit goes back to where he came from, heaven. But Jesus said, I'll pray to the Father to send you, my disciples, my students, my followers, my body, my church. I'll pray to the Father to send you another helper, the helper who's helping me right now, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father. That's where he is right now. The Bible says he's waiting until what? His enemies are made his footstool. As a matter of fact, Hebrews words it best. He offered himself up one time for sins forever. And then sat down at the right hand of his father waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. We also know that he's also, Romans 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit is present with us making intercession for the saints here on the earth. And Jesus is also at the right hand of the Father making intercession for the saints. So we have Jesus standing in the gap for us in heaven and the Holy Spirit standing in the gap for us on earth. That sounds like a combo that you just can't. How do you lose with that? Okay. So Jesus is going to ascend as he's telling his disciples. He's, He's getting ready to ascend. And he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And what's the first word in the next verse? Go. Okay, what was he saying here? He's saying, I'm going to go back to heaven. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cover authority in heaven. But being that I also have authority on earth, but I'm going to be in heaven. And I'm the head. And you're going to be on earth. And you're the body. I'm still covering authority on earth because you're here. You want to know what this word go means in the Greek? It means a number of things, but here's the one definition that stands out. Transfer. It means transfer. So the moment he said go, what did he do? He transferred his authority, his exousia to his body in the earth. And he said, I'll conduct authority in heaven. You conduct authority in the earth. Which means I'm conducting authority in heaven and on earth. So we gave the whole body of Christ his authority. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have exousia. You have authority. The devil can't tell you what to do. The devil can't wield power over you unless you give it to him. Unless you give him the right to. The Bible says, nor give place to the devil. So if you give him place... You gave him a right. But on his own, he has no right. He can't do to you what he wants to do to you whenever he feels like it. He doesn't have a right. I have the authority to talk to him how I want to talk to him in the name of Jesus. And we'll pick up next time. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for every gift you've given us. We thank you for your word. It's your word that we know what we have. Or by way of your word, we know what we have. We know what we can do and who we are and where we are. So I thank you. That your word will not return to you void. But it'll accomplish what you set it out to do. It's going to prosper. It's going to prosper where you sent it. And the word has been sent into the ground today. The hearts of those watching. The hearts of those present with us. I declared early on these are hearts of good ground. And so the word will produce in their lives. It'll be seen. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making the invitations I'll mention in just a second available to the people. I ask that everyone repeat after me. Since the pandemic began, this has been the most effective way to minister Jesus and the Holy Spirit. I've been in awe of people who, who will not raise their hand when I ask if you want Jesus. But when I have him repeat after me and I ask, was this your first time? And those hands go up. So we don't want to miss out on anyone, even if it's just one. Amen. Watch this, even if they're not in this room right now. Amen. But we have a massive online family. And if it's just one, then we're grateful. It was a harvest Amen. on this day. So repeat after me saying, dear God, dear God. you said in your word. To repent because the kingdom is near. You said, if I would confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that you've raised him from the dead, I would be saved. You said, whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Well, on this day, I repent of my sins. And I do confess, and I do believe, that he is Lord, that he took away the sin of the world, and that you raised him from the dead. I'm now part of his church, his kingdom, his body and family. He's my Savior and Lord, my head and king. I am your child, you are my father. And I'll serve you all the days of my life. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. That's not, that's not just the only way that you get salvation. That's how you get exousia. Authority. Now on to the dunamis. If you've never received the Holy Spirit. Just repeat after me so we cover everyone. Heavenly Father. I see in your word. The early church. The very first disciples. They didn't go forth. Preaching the gospel. Until they received. Power from heaven. They were filled with the spirit. They spoke with other tongues. As the spirit gave them utterance. Like them on that day. By faith. I received the gift of the spirit. I'm now filled with the Spirit. I too have received my heavenly language. But most importantly, I'm now a witness for the King and Kingdom. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. For those online, if you prayed either of these prayers for the very first time, and you wonder what's next, where do I go from here? The email address you see on the screen before you, admin at faithdome.org. You can reach out to us to find out. In addition to that, if you're interested in becoming a part of our family of faith, then this same email address is where you want to send your request. For those present, we don't want to assume that this is a believer's meeting only. So if there are any here, you prayed either of those prayers for the first time so that the ushers can see your hand Raise them at this time. Salvation. Holy Spirit. Okay. Everyone is born again. Which means everyone is operating in the exousia of Jesus. The authority. And it appears that everyone's filled with the Spirit. That means you're also operating in the dunamis. And ability of the Holy Spirit. Also, notice that the, we're going to see this next week in detail. Notice that not only Jesus, but the disciples as well. They didn't do any great signs and wonders until after they were filled with the Spirit. So it makes sense that Jesus said, I felt dynamis go out of me when the woman with the issue. Because that's, what, that's what's causing the healing. That's what's causing the curing. But then somebody has to have authority to operate in it. Jesus had the authority. On this side of the cross, who has it? Well, he still has it, but who has he given it to? He's given it to us. It's time to give now. 
have the authority to do this as well. <laughs> giving so. Giving us, giving, we, we as believers should, this should be second nature for us. Giving. We're created for good works to walk in them. We've been created to do good deeds. There's no greater deed than, than giving. And we know what the scripture says about giving and the benefit of giving and the return as well. Giving it shall be given. Whatever one sows, so shall that one reap. Jesus talked about the word of God being sown into our hearts and, and reaping the hundredfold or manifold return of the word in our hearts. And so that applies as well to whatever it is you give. I mean, if I'm giving love, I want a manifold return on love. If I'm giving trust, I want a manifold return on trust. And guess what? If I'm sowing finances, I want a manifold return on finances as well. But more than that, whatever the cause is or the need is, I'm, I'm rejoicing because it's met or I'm helping or contributing to it being met. Many ways that you can give. These ways for our online family on the screen, as well as those present, you see them on the screen. But if you are giving this day, I'm sure you're already prepared, so let's lift our gifts up to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus. He'll take them, worship the Father on our behalf. I'll pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to give, the opportunity to sow towards whatever you're doing in the earth realm in this hour by way of the kingdom of God. We count it an honor and privilege to be workers with you. The fellow laborers going forth into the plentiful harvest. We're spreading the message of our living Savior, whether senders or goers or both. Seeing to it that that message goes forth into this dying world. And I thank you that as we give this day, according to what we have as we purpose in our heart, doing so cheerfully that we will reap the corresponding manifold return on our giving. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. All right, now we're going to we'll minister to the sick. If there are any, no, you know what? I, let me word it like this. Anyone, if, if you're combating, contending with, because in Christ, we're, we're not sick. We're not, that's not our identity. We, we may be dealing with something, but that's not our identity. It's not who we are. We, we are the healed. That's who we are. And so think about it. If, 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 you're a, if you're a certain somebody or if you've been identified a particular way in God, it, it would make sense that the devil would want to convince us that we're somebody we're not or, or talk us out of what we've rightly, rightfully acquired in Jesus, healing being one of those. So we prayed early on. We like to set the atmosphere right. As dad always talked about being distraction free from receiving the word. Pain can be a distraction. Depression and heaviness can be a distraction. So we don't want anyone to suffer from that. So we have one person who would like hands laid on them. All right. So you can bring them forward and, and we have two. Okay. And you can line them up. There's healing in the atmosphere. It, it's the power to, the power to heal is present. We know that. So let's just get in agreement with that. Father, I prayed early on for divine health and divine healing to manifest. So we set ourselves in agreement with what we've already declared. But your word also says that the prayer of faith will heal the sick and that the elders of the church should lay hands on the sick. But you, Father, you would do the rest. And that is you would raise them up. I'm a believing one. I will lay hands on the sick. Expecting the sick to recover because that's what your word says, Father. Those contending with any kind of sickness, disease, pain, or malady, or infirmity. We also rejoice, Father, for those who have already received their healing. We shout hallelujah for that. But we continue to stand in faith with these who have come forward. Or those who may not be present but have not seen the manifestation. But if in fact... They believe they receive when we pray, then they'll have. And Father, we know this to be truth because your word declares that if we pray according to your will, you hear us. 
And if we know that you hear us, we know we have the petitions we've asked of you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, it's sad how, how divided the body is, even today in 2023. I came across, I don't look for, I don't, I don't, when I, when I finish Bible study, when I finish Sunday service, I don't go home looking for other messages to listen to or watch. But sometimes if I'm, if I'm looking, doing a quick look on social media or on YouTube, I'll come across a clip. And I came across a clip of a minister saying, um, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are being so confident that God heard you in prayer? Now, now on one hand, I would, I would agree with him and say, yes, sir, I, I, I concur. Who do we think we are? However, if the word says that if we pray according to his will, he hears us, well, then I know who I am. It's not who do I think I am. I know who I am. Because now if I didn't pray according to his will, then it would be justified for, for one to ask the question, who do you think you are going to God, not praying his will, and then thinking he heard you. But the Bible, the word, the word's older than everyone in this room and everyone watching online. And so the word already, before we were born, the word already established that if we pray according to his will, he hears. Matter of fact, the scripture opens up with, this is the confidence we have. Not hope. Not wonder. This is the confidence we have that if we pray according to his will, he hears us. And then the next part doesn't say, and if we think he hears us, if we know he hears us, well, then guess what else we know? We know we have the petitions we've asked of him. We know it. So when it comes to praying according to his will, yeah, I know who I am. But some people have this idea that, that conducting yourself in that kind of way is you making yourself equal with God. Well, that's not what anyone is saying. We're just saying what the Word says. Just saying what the Word says. A few things before we close. Thank you all for showing up today and online family for, for logging on. We invite you to join us immediately following service in the YIC next Sunday, January 29th, for a community brain health fair. Please wear comfortable shoes and come prepared to take advantage of all the amazing resources that will be available, including free items, demonstrations, and much more. Food trucks will also be available for you to purchase lunch if you like. And of course, you can purchase copies of the messages from Sundays and Tuesdays by ordering online or by calling the church office. And our prayer line is currently available Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6.30 a.m. and 2 p.m. I want to say this about our intercessory prayer warriors. Um, you know, before the, when the pandemic hit, we all were secure in God, but we, we know what's going to happen in the earth. We knew, we knew that nothing would by any means hurt us. We, we, we should not have been scared of COVID. But as far as what's about to happen next? Well, we're finite creatures, so we weren't necessarily sure. So what we did in the beginning of the pandemic was we, we did a seven day a, a week, three different time slots of, of prayer warriors going in and, and just interceding. And they did it the whole pandemic. And, and that's work. And we know prayer can be exhausting because Jesus' blood was like, I mean, Jesus sweat praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, like great drops of blood. And the, and the scripture would say he would withdraw himself away from crowds to go and pray. So we know pray. There are some powerful things going on in the spirit realm when you pray. Well, well, we realized that our, 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 our warriors weren't getting breaks and they, they needed some off days because they're human. And so you, you may notice now that we're, 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 we're only doing Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, they did their assignment for the pandemic. 
Remember, it was something we never had before. So a healthy compromise is having it only a few days now uh, and giving them some time to, to rest from their labor and work of prayer. So if you notice that it went from Tuesdays and Thursdays, or it went from every day to Tuesday and Thursday, that's the reason. So 6.30 a.m. and 2 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And of course, you can find that info on our social media pages as well. We look forward to everyone who will show up tonight and those who will log on. We'll continue our lesson, Genealogical Illuminations. So let's stand now and we can depart. Father, we thank you. We praise you for your grace, for your protection. You've given your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways, protecting us from all hurt, harm, and danger, lest we dash our feet against stones, because we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And I think that all satanic assignments set against us are canceled now and immediately in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I thank you that because we are the heirs of salvation, we have ministering spirits ready to minister for us, and they respond to the word of God in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We'll see you tonight.